tell us a little bit about what you do right now. So I own Pure Tropics um, Natural Skincare. I own also another company called Asuria Elixir, um, also a natural skincare company. So I'm in the beauty realm. To me, it's the best area for anyone to be in. But um, quick rundown, we're doing 100,000, over 100,000 a month. Um, we grew the whole business off Instagram and we're still growing on there. Hey, David, thanks for joining us today. No problem, man. It's Thank a pleasure you. to be here. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Where did you grow up? Uh, what was your childhood like? So I grew up in California, um, San Bernardino, Loma Linda, Fontana area. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I had a, a interesting childhood, I'd say. Um, I was always in trouble for mixing up stuff, stuff, um, making my own products. And the school system didn't really fit me, so my mom decided to homeschool us. So in homeschooling me, my brother, she kind of pushed the whole science aspect, encouraged us to do what we want mm -hmm. within a certain, you know, boundary. She wouldn't get mad if we set something on fire in the backyard, as you know, as long as we didn't do no damage. But at the same time, she allowed us that freedom to go buy his stuff and, you know, give us that freedom to play around and explore, I'll say. So homeschooled. Um, most of our cousins were homeschooled. We have a little own science competitions and fairs. So, I mean, that pretty much was it. Grew up in a Caribbean household in America mm -hmm. and talk back, very family oriented. So it is an interesting childhood at most, to say the least. It. I love it. And, um, as far as your last name goes, you mentioned that Caribbean upbringing last name mm -hmm. is Wong K. Uh, first correct. of all, correct. Okay. Yeah, so that's correct. So my grandfather moved from China to um, Belize and when he moved to Belize there was already a uh, he was opening a store and um, I have some pictures of it on my Instagram and um, the store was a uh, Wong's general store so he so he couldn't open the same one so he took the K from another part of his name created Wong K so that's why whenever people see you know or I hear someone say they know that last name or they pronounce it right the first time I know they know one of my like direct cousins because from my grandfather on down, that's where that name came from. Oh, very So, cool. yeah, he opened a store later on, opened a huge citrus farm, really big in Belize. Um, our name's really known out there. Wow, very cool. So you had the entrepreneurial bug in your family, your grandfather, and then obviously your mother let you and your, your siblings get into um, different things. They It sounds like you figured out early on that maybe the academic route like traditionally wasn't the way for you. But, uh, uh, you know, I wanted, I preferred to be in school and homeschooled, but uh, my mom's seen something more. She always laughs and says this. She's like, I, I've been grooming you your whole life and you didn't even know. She, you know, at an early age, opened a bank account for us or would send me into places to pay bills for her and taught us how to track a checkbook, um, stuff like that. So she's always kept the real, my mom had her own business at the time too, mm. but she Makes always sense. kept us. She was a nurse, so she had her own little nursing agency. Oh, wow. And she'd sit down and teach us and show us stuff. And at the time, we didn't really realize or pay attention to it. But through the homeschooling, through that, it kind of groomed us now towards, you know, that direction. Um, she encouraged us to be free thinkers and to explore our creativity. Mm. Okay, very cool. So would you say it's because of your mother um, that you, you took the entrepreneur route in life or... Uh, what sort of like maybe experience did you have that helped you decide that maybe corporate route or traditional route wasn't the one for you? I wouldn't say it was because of her, but I'll say she played a big part. Um, I found an old, I want to say like, I must have been like 14, 15. I took my GED at 15, so it was probably about 15. And I found a book that they had made me. And in it, it had me with like cars and traveling and nice hotels. And they always laughed about my high quality taste, they called it. So I always knew like a regular job wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. And being homeschooled, my mom has as much ADD as me. Um, I kind of realized that being indoors, sitting at a desk or sitting one place wasn't for me. So there was a lot of days where we just disappeared, jump on in California, they have Metrolink. So mm -hmm. we jump on Metrolink from Fontana to 
to LA and hit the museums and hit the his, natural history museum or do different stuff. And we'd spend the whole day at these places and then have to write a report on it. So our school was more, not so much rigid, but fluid. There was days where we'd sit and study at a book and have to sit at the table. But then there was days where we'd go work at the park or work at, go to a museum and different stuff. So in doing that, I'd say it kind of showed me that or encouraged that I don't have to be so rigid in my thinking. Cause even now, like I can't sit at my desk all day. Half the day, my employees laugh at me because I'd take a little 55 gallon barrel I cut in half and go sit outside in a chair with my barrel as a desk and work on my laptop outside. Mm. I kind of have to have a stimulation around me, but not too much where I can't focus. You learned early on that it was okay to go against the status quo and do your own thing. Like you didn't have to always uh, fit oh within yeah, the box. Uh, my whole life, I'm a, against the status quo. They called me a rebel without a cause growing up. I was always against status quo. Like if you said go left, I'm going right. As long, but I was always, you know, willing to live with my consequences. So, yeah, um, staying against status quo even to this day is a big part of me. What are some of the benefits or the advantages that like entrepreneurship affords you? <laughs> oh man! So in the last six years, I've been to like thirty countries. Thirty. Yeah, it's a lot of, list a few, uh, list a few. And there's a lot of those that are repeats. Like I've been to Brazil about eight times and Colombia about eight, 10 times. But um, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, all the Caribbean, Central, South America. It's been over to Thailand, Philippines, South Africa, Morocco, Istanbul. Been a lot of places, man. And one of the, the like I, I went to Brazil, that's my second home. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Brazil for like three months. And as long, as long as I had my laptop or my cell phone, I was making money. So I'll go to the beach, work out, hang out on the beach all day, come home, come to the Airbnb, make sure my business is running straight and head right back out. Because if I have my phone and Wi-Fi, I was making money. If I'm gone, because I'm gone a lot, um, if I have a laptop or my phone, I'm capable of making money. And that's not something you could do with a regular job. That's right. And um, David, I don't think that a lot of people know that, that there is, you know, another path that you can lead in life. You don't have to be stuck in a cubicle. You don't have to be doing what everyone else is doing. You can say, no. you can say your own, do your own thing. And in my opinion, I was late to entrepreneurship because I went to school. I mean, I'm an aircraft mechanic and a pilot still. And I didn't really get into entrepreneurship till 25. Mm. where I'm looking at some of these younger guys, like my boy Trey with Spurgo, and he's 14 making 300,000 a month. So in my eyes, I got into it late, but it's never too late. I mean, to go after what you wanted. Yeah, and you get that freedom. And it's I'm not gonna say it's less work, it's more work. Mm. But at the end of the day, I mean, what's more important, you leave that legacy and you have the freedom and you can pass something on. You can help or do whatever you want. Like if my mom goes home to Guyana to do whatever, I can go with her. I can work. Um, I take time out my day every day to groom my little nephew who's 14 and I give him homework on different business subjects and I, I got him a bank account and I teach him stuff. And mm -hmm. you're able to do this stuff because you have that freedom. Because you have, I'm not saying if you don't have a job, you can't do some of that stuff, but yeah. if I had a job, I'm not quick to take time off or play sick, but to disappear. <laughs> but you know, you get a different level of it once you on your own, once you have your own thing going. Mm. Yeah. Now, in your opinion, like how should our listeners decide if entrepreneurship is right for them? Um, some people like security. But if you get to that point in your life where you want more and your job is not providing it for you, I would say at that point, look into it. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to jump off the brick cliff that, you know, you got that same jump and Make your parachute as you go. You don't got to do that. Dip your toe in. Start a little business on Etsy and just see how it runs. And at a certain point, if it's for you, you're going to enjoy it to where it's a part of your everyday life. And once you start doing that, you know that's for you and you need to follow that path. But if it's not for you, you also know. I mean, life is very direct in how it leads you and the ebbs and flows. You just have to pay attention to it. Got it. Now, as f back to your entrepreneurial journey, how did you get started? Like, what was your first business? Um, this pretty much was my first business. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 this was my first business. 
So I own Pure Tropics um, Natural Skincare. I own also a, another company called Assure Elixir, um, also a natural skincare company. So I'm in the beauty realm. To me, it's the best area for anyone to be in. But um, quick rundown, we're doing 100,000, over 100,000 a month. Um, we grew the whole business off Instagram and we're still growing on there. So wow. that's just a quick, you know, quick rundown. But what, how I started or what I started, I always was looking for something more. Mm-hmm. Always looking for my own business. I didn't really know what direction to go. It was actually my mom, funny enough, to encourage me to go the skincare route. Because in my head, it wasn't something men did make skincare. Sure. But, um, especially I'm fixing jets and doing stuff for the military. So it wasn't you know, my first choice. Mm-hmm. But she pointed out that was something I was always doing. And to follow what I did and did best. Because I was around 13, 14. That's sixth grade. I remember making my own colognes and doing stuff like that. So she's like, you do this all the time. You make your own products. You might as well step into that area. And at that point, I was already making my own products. Why do you think you've been such a big success? I mean, $100,000 a month is no easy fee. And to especially do that just all on Instagram alone. Why do you think you succeeded while other people fail at this? (laughs) Um, Once again, that's, I'm not going to say destiny, but the Incredibles, um, Edna, a little inventor on Incredibles, she had a quote that says, luck favors prepared. That's okay. one of my favorite quotes. But I think I started studying and I start paying attention. And once something catches my attention, I really go into it. So I'll learn everything about it. I could make a recipe off the top of my head or tell you what 90% of ingredients do. So once I started and once the snowball started rolling, because I was prepared, because I was always trying to stay ahead, it allowed me to be more successful. Now, another thing I say I was am to this day is diligent. Um, I don't think, I mean, Instagram will have you think you work four hours a day, four hour work week, and you're off the rest of the damn time. And it's not that. Uh, I'm, I mean, I know I hear I, I'm always out of town, but if I'm in town, I'm at my office 12 to 16 hours a day. And I might not be physically sitting on my computer. I get tired of this and quick, I'll go make some products. I might be just looking for a next product to make. Mm-hmm. I might just be playing with something. I was sitting here um, playing with this. I spot some soap while I was in Columbia a week ago. And I'm sitting here recreating and making my own. And then I carved a logo and I'm going to get a st- soap stamp made. I might just be doing something creative for the love of it. But in even doing that, I'm being diligent. Mm. Um, I don't know how much of a Bible believer is, but my mom used to whip us with it. And there's a quote that says, um, a diligent man will sit at the table of Kings. So Mm. whatever I'm doing, whether it was back and this goes back before I started my business, when I had a job, I was diligent. I show up on time. You ain't got to tell me to do my work or what I, am I done? I get done ahead of time and just drip feed the work out, but my work is done. And it's always done. I could go to any job I ever had and they will welcome me back with open arms, but that's because I'm diligent. So I would say a lot of people get caught up in this Instagram lifestyle of I'm a CEO, I'm an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. but their business isn't a CEO business. Their business isn't making an entrepreneur business. Mm -hmm. That quote, that word or that term is a a thing that's thrown around lightly, but you're not putting in the work. You're doing it for the look of it, but you're not actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. So I say most people who don't succeed, A, didn't do a research right. So they're selling something or they're positioning their business in an area where it's limited growth. Mm-hmm. And most important thing, because even in that area or that type of thing, you can pivot. But the most important thing is they're not diligent. Diligent, prepared, just putting in the work. Like you said, putting a lot of people. Work every day. Mm-hmm. I worked a full-time job when I started my business. I would come home and work four, five, six, seven hours. I'd go to sleep at midnight and be up at and at the office by six and come home and make products, fulfill bottles and package bottles and fulfill orders at night. So you did this simultaneously. What, what were you doing work for, for work at the time? So I was a contractor at a government agency. Mm-hmm. Um, we did R&D, research and development for new things for airplanes. So at that place, I was a test pilot and a mechanic. So I was doing a lot of stuff and we were creating new processes. And you knew there that you were going to make the transition? 
<laughs> when I got my interview, I told them I'm retiring at 25. Mm. They laughed. And every year, because I was 22, 23, every 22, every year, they would ask me, oh, oh, it's almost that time. And 25, bought a house, retired out of there. And mm. I laughed my way out the office. But yeah, I was working full time job and building my company while working. Um, when I was doing stuff, I would work with my headphones in so I can listen to podcasts. I was listening mm-hmm. to two, three podcasts a day. To this day, I'm on a audio one. Well, it used to be two audio books a week, but it's about an audio book a week mm-hmm. and a podcast a day. And at any given time, you could ask me what book I have, and I have a book with me. I love it. I'm always reading. I'm always mm-hmm. studying. Uh, keep a journal with me at all times. But mm-hmm. um, when I had a job, I wrote down that. I started my business and I was like, by the beginning of the year, which was six months from that date, I'm going to do a hundred thousand in sales. Didn't know how I hadn't made no sales, but I knew I had a purpose. I knew my goal and I wrote it down and I would write it down every week. And I want to say it was like a February. I was looking in my journal, just flipping through and I ran into it and I was like, oh shit. I almost started crying, but I had made a hundred thousand by my time frame, And, um, You know, I believe in writing down. I believe in speaking things into existence. And, you know, that's a big part, like you say, being prepared. Mm. So I know that I have this goal in mind and I have to figure out what I have to do to get it. I know for this Black Friday, which is in a few weeks, I'm trying to do 200,000 in a weekend. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking to see how I can do it. Henceforth, in the last week and a half, I've been here every day. For like 18 hours, I've come up with 10 new products to start selling. Everything from candles and lip balms to new soaps to new products. I'm just getting imported to add to my order value. So I know what I, I know the goal. And now the process is just finding the avenues to get there. But what was the turning point in your business? When did things really start to take off for you? (laughs) That's an easy one. So I had did the shout out on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I paid this Instagram page to promote one of my posts. And I remember doing a thousand dollars that day. Now I'm making stuff at home. How long ago was this by the way? So my business is going almost on five, four or five years. Mm -hmm. So this was very early. This was in that first six month period. Mm -hmm. I remember doing that shout out and getting a thousand dollars a day. I didn't have enough for products or anything for it. So I ordered everything on my credit card, express shipped everything, ran around to two, three beauty stores to pick up the stuff I need Mm -hmm. in order to get those orders out. And at that point, I was like, game over. I got two, 300 followers from this and a thousand dollars in a day, (laughs) game over. You figured it out (laughs) at that point. Oh, right then, click instantly. This is what I have to do. And I doubled down. And I'd get more money. And there was times where I'd spend in my whole paycheck on ingredients. And I remember it was like two weeks where I had to borrow money from my mom just to get gas, to get to work, to make it till Friday. Because I was just ordering stuff to build my business. Hmm. And so once we start making money, that money only went towards the business. Now, were you always succeeding though? Like as far as like the strategies you were trying out? Because I think that maybe a lot of people in the e-com space, they've heard of paying for a promotion, like a shout out or, or doing some sort of endorsement. Uh, mm-hmm. It doesn't always pan out the way it did for you. Uh, were there, you know, were there other like things that you tried out that didn't, that weren't successful? Or were you I would just- say the only reason that doesn't pan out for them is because mm-hmm. they're not connecting with their audience. So if you're doing a shout out, you need to do your research on what page you're doing a shout out on and who their audience is. Because if you're, you know, and I find most business entrepreneurs have an idea of who they want their audience to be, but don't know who their audience is. Hmm. So if you know who your audience is and you know where they hang out, you're going to make money. And if you're not, you need to change. If you're running pictures, you need to run videos. If you're running videos, you need to run videos and pictures. You need to have a testimonial. There's stuff that they need to do where they just put one shout out and don't know the results of that and it didn't work. It didn't work for me. I get that all the time. Well, did you ask the pace to send you the insights? No. Did you, who are you targeting? Well, this is a hair page and I sell hair. So that means I should make sales. It doesn't mean that. So they need to know who they're targeting 
they need to know a little psychology behind it. So when you write your caption or your post, whatever, you're using some psychology in it. That way you're attracting people. Mm-hmm. And most of all, you need to have your own Instagram page prepared. If I go to an Instagram page, or I still see people do this, they have no real domain name. Their domain name is buy soap at Big Cartel. Why? Your domain name is $14. Go buy it for the year. Yeah. And then you go to their website, and their website looks like they've made it in 15 minutes. You could go to Wix and make a gorgeous site. I'm, my first website was on Wix. Mm-hmm. It was ugly. It's ugly to me now, and I'm ashamed of it now. But at the time, it was gorgeous. Yeah, It worked. So I think a lot of people get caught up or don't do their research, and then their sales show that they didn't do their research. Yeah. You go to a page, and the page looks crappy. I don't trust to put my credit card number on this page. I was going to say, you could go to Fiverr and hire somebody for $400 and have an award-winning website. You know, I think it comes down to just lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge and lack of actual care. Uh, talk to us about the importance of marketing and sales and education. Marketing and sales is everything. Um, mm-hmm. I approach marketing and sales a little different than other people because I find the hive mentality to be very rampant in the entrepreneur culture. Mm-hmm. So I try not to allow outside influences to dictate my marketing. And by outside influences, I mean Instagram. Mm-hmm. So I like to read and interpret stuff differently. So one of my favorite books for marketing is not even a marketing book. It's called Fascinate by Sally Hogshead. And it's about how to fascinate your customers and knowing who your customer is and knowing who you are in order to capitalize on your strengths in order to get people. So if I want to hit someone's lust trigger, I know what words and I know how to direct them to the lust trigger. If I want to play on their self-conscious, I'm going to write a post that talks about how bad it looks when they take their clothes off or they're wearing a bikini in summer and everybody's looking at their, their ingrown hairs. So when I market or target, I'm playing a psychological game with them. And I always love psychology. So I guess it's easy for me to roll in that path, but I'm not. All right. So a lot of my boys, one of my boys, um, he's, he runs a lot of ads and I'm always the one he calls. I'm like, yo, you have a wife, use your wife. You're selling a dream. So by selling a dream to your customers, you need to bring your wife in. Cause a lot of them has a husband or a wife. And you need to incorporate that. Bring your wife in, sell a dream. Me and my family did this. Now we're taking jets all over. And he's like, bro, that works. I know it works because you're playing on a psychological key point on a lot of people. They're trying to get this freedom for their family. So now I'll tell you a story. Mm. And then he starts telling the story. I said, perfect. Retire your mom now. Because if you retire your mom, now they look at it like, man, I always want to take care of my mom. And it works. Because you're targeting these psychological triggers people don't even realize. Mm -hmm. And whether we realize it or not, the best companies, that's how they're marketing to us. Instagram doesn't have to market to us. You get on their app once, the app is designed to trap you. The app is designed to play on your subconscious. I didn't get it. (laughs) I I talked to quite a few Instagram models. And I will see them post. And I'll see them sit there and watch their phone. And if the post doesn't get a certain amount of likes within the time frame, they delete their post psychological they're trained to do something for like Mm -hmm. so instagram facebook everybody does it but we as entrepreneurs haven't quite figured that out yet some of us have big companies have that's why they hire all these people to do it but as a i don't like to say mom and pop but that's exactly what everybody is when they're starting out Mm -hmm. mom and pop entrepreneurs haven't figured that out a pretty picture sells and a pretty instagram sells or it looks good, but it's not going to bring in the numbers as a before and after. Yeah, your page doesn't look as nice. But at the end of the day, does your Instagram page looking nice make you money? Mm-hmm. Or are you selling a, a, a cure for a problem? Is that making you money? Mm-hmm. So it just comes down to how you look at it. And the importance of marketing can never be understated because that's how we make money. And if you're not making money, what are you doing it for? And I don't care. Even nonprofits make money yeah. because that's how they keep the lights on. That's the Go biggest, ahead. that's the biggest challenges uh, businesses have, right? Is obscurity. It's never a lack yeah. of like, not, it's usually not that they have a bad product or service. 
but it's just too few people know about them. Obscurity and customer service. Two things that will kill you. Um, customer service, meaning if you're a drop shipper and it takes your customer six weeks to get your product, mm-hmm. you're not going to have a return customer. If you have bad reviews, you're not going to have a good a return customer. But that comes in hand in hand to um, your marketing. That uh, comes hand in hand with everything else because in order to even get that sales, you have to have your marketing. And before you waste your money paying for everything, make sure your ducks are in the row. Absolutely. So make sure your Instagram is set up. Make sure your website's set up. At least, even if you don't know what email marketing is, be collecting emails. There's little stuff in a five-minute Google search will tell you what you need. Yeah, five minutes. But Google nobody search. does it. A book. And um, you mentioned a book earlier, but like, could you recommend for the listeners maybe two books for learning about some of these sorts of things, whether it's like behavioral psychology, like you were talking about, or just marketing? Uh, what are two of your top recommendations? There's a lot of books. And I say before you even get any of that, I'd say pick up a book called Compound Effect. Compound Effect. I want to say by Darren Hardy. Mm-hmm. Master yourself before you master anything else. Mm. compound effect teaches you about the little minute changes that you add to your day or to your business that changes the course of your your journey and then fascinate is a good book by sally hogshead um she has that and the revised version and um there's so many books a book i just read that i love is by 50 cent go figure hustle hard hustle smarter mm-hmm um, I've read that about four times. And um, there's a book, it's called, it's a yellow book and it has people on a hamster wheel, The Power of Habit. I don't know who it's by. That book is a good book that, it doesn't teach you marketing, but it teaches you people's habits. And it teaches you how even someone who's completely lost all their memory, but has walk, been walking the same path every year, day, the last 30 years somehow walk that same path with no memory don't know where they're going don't mm-hmm. know where they came from but they're on the same path but by incorporating those books into your marketing into your techniques you're instantly going to be getting better um david were you completely self-taught or did you have mentors showing you the ropes i'm completely self-taught completely um, self-taught. i have a lot of friends who have mentors and stuff my mentors is audible <laughs> oh. <laughs> my mentor is I legitimately have 150 books on there or more that I've gone through um, I have a book collection at home of over 200 books hmm. um, I believe that and a mentor is good and I have a mentor now somewhat or people I can call and ask questions more hmm. so but I believe that everybody I get DMs every day Will you be my mentor? Would you be my mentor? For what? If you don't have the will and self-drive to teach yourself, what am I? Like, I get a call like at least 10 times a week about, hey, bro, what do I need to do to get my LLC? Start with Google. Takes two minutes. But I believe the mentor aspect is good, but at the same time, by ingesting all this knowledge, if a billionaire has put his time and effort into writing a book, giving you All the steps he took to get there, why wouldn't you read it? That's your mentor. And there's a billion books you can read and you can take one key aspect or one takeaway. That's all it takes, one takeaway per book. I'm reading a book right now called The Secret Teachings of Plants. It's a spiritual book on plants and how back in the day, people were more connected to nature and nature told them when the the weather was going to change. Nature told them, if you were sick, do this. And nature did this. And there's one key takeaway you can take from that book that's going to affect your business and how you move. So I believe my mentors are my books. Mm. That's where I learn from. That's who teaches me when I'm confused. Somehow, when I'm lost, 90% of the time, I guarantee because I buy books all the time. I don't always read them right away. So I was having an issue, couldn't figure out an issue, found a book in my office on the same issue I'm having. Hey, well, look at God. I had a book on directions I needed and I didn't even know I needed it yet. So I'm all for books. Yeah, David, I think that was so huge what you said because a lot of our listeners, I'm sure, feel like they don't have all the information, they don't know enough. 
and they always feel like maybe someone else has it or someone else can give it to them. But like you're an example of that, you know, you don't always have to look outside of yourself. You have everything that you need. Um, all you have to do is be diligent, uh, get prepared and, and just do whatever it takes. Like you, you, you obviously are a great example of that. I know people talk about, oh, my circle, my circle, my circle. I didn't have a circle of entrepreneurs till after I was making 80 grand a month. Uh, and they wanted to be in my circle simply because I was making money and I could teach them. And now these people who are making $14,000 a month are making more money than me a month mm. because they're niche and they're, they're taking a little bit of information. I give them and a little information and other people's giving them and they ran with it. Mm. So you can't expect millionaires to hang with you. Million <laughs> Eagles don't hang with pigeons. Uh -huh. So if you a pigeon, don't expect the ego to hang with you. Stay with the pigeons. Yeah, that reminds well, me I, of something T.D. Jake said, right? The eagles and the chickens. Oh, exactly. My mom used yeah. to use that. But um, take the time to learn. Uh, I mean, when I first started, I secluded myself to the point where my friends were not even invited me out. I'd be like, wait, you guys want to have wings without me? Like, you never come with us, so why would we invite you? Like, yeah, true. So, I mean, I took time to seclude myself. I took time to take the time to learn and teach myself and to not be ashamed to say no and not go somewhere. I'm learning because I want to go somewhere. I could do more work in six months by myself than you guys can do with a mentor and a circle of entrepreneurs in two years. Mm. So I'm going to take that time to really sit and drive myself. I'm going to study what other companies are doing to make myself successful. Mm. I'm going to look for the holes and the gaps in their marketing, and then I'm going to target those holes and gaps. I love that. That reminds me of a, a quote I read the other day. It's an African proverb. It goes, um, you can move, when you move alone, you move fast, but when you move together, you move further. So it sounds like you took advantage of uh, being on your own and working on yourself. And then eventually you attracted the opportunity to work with others, uh, whether it was attracting a mentor or cultivating a circle of friends. So like you didn't put the cart before the horse, you just Mm -mm. did the most with what you had and i love that's that. what you have to do um so like i said social media leads people to destruction it leads people to a lot of money too okay. so <laughs> but really? it's easy to get caught up in that whole mindset right mm -hmm. i'm an entrepreneur i gotta take these travel pigs they're going people are going into debt they're they're living a life they can't live trying to keep up with what they see if you're not making money on social media you don't really need to be on there Mm. I'm on social media all day and I could tell you what company is doing what or what they changed to their website this this and this I will go look at companies hunt them down I will go steal their followers and steal their customers oh you left a bad review on so-and-so's page let me send you some free product mm. oh you sent all these models some products I'm gonna send all the same models you sent the products so clearly they work with your inferior ass brand they're gonna work with me. I'm some better <laughs> stuff. Um, wow. <laughs> I will see whatever pages is giving you shout outs and you're doing sales, and I will go after it everywhere you are. Wow. My friends laugh and say you're a shark. And they're like, most people don't even realize it. I go for what I want. I want to succeed. And if there's Harvey. something in my way, I'm gonna go. Yeah, I'm gonna go for it. I respect. I mean, I'm a real all my friends love to tell me that it's enough money out here for everybody, and I fully agree. But my mindset tells me it ain't enough money out here for everybody. People are like, who's your direct competition? And my favorite answer is who's selling skincare products? They're like, but they're not even in your market. It does not matter. If they, someone is spending money on them, they should be spending money on me. That's my mindset. David, I where does that come money from? For everybody. Where does that come from, though? That, that why, that motivation? I'm a, you. I'm a highly competitive person since I was little. That's how I learned how to swim, how I learned to drive. I've done everything. So I can compete with somebody who doesn't know I'm competing with them and I can still be best friends with them. It was not going to affect me in a way where I'm looking at them funny, but it's going to affect me like, oh, he just did this. I can do this too. Not only can I do it, I can do it better. So I think we have this whole mindset of everybody's out here and we can all do this together. Crabs in a barrel. That's all you're going to end up. You have to have the mindset is I'm here to win. Regardless of what's going on around me, I'm here to win. And I have to stay focused on my goal. Just a thousand could fall to my left. 
I'm still focused. To my right, I'm still focused. But at the same time, you still have to be able to help people. You still have to be able to reach out and be able to communicate. We're going to say, no matter what happens, just don't lose sight on what your goal is and keep pushing. Love it. And um, speaking of helping people and, and, and getting help yourself, obviously you helped yourself early on, but you did mention that at this point you do have a mentor. So what's that relationship like and how did you find them? I like dirty mentors. None 30. of them are really mentors. Okay. There's a lot of them. They all Indirect. own businesses. They're all doing better than me. And the relationship is if I call and you have a question, I mean, not just a, a little BS question, but a real question, I'm going to call you. If I need advice, I'm going to call and ask. I don't need to take your whole day up. I don't need you to stay on top of me. My job is to stay on top of you. I need you for the an- to provide the answers that I cannot provide myself. Mm. So if I call my mentor and say, hey, and this is a real conversation, why the hell can I get over $100,000 a month in sales? And they're like, well, what are you doing? And I run down what I'm doing. And they'll say, like, you need to be doing more of this. You're too busy, stuck doing menial tasks when you need to hire people to do the menial tasks. That way you can go out and get the money. That's the kind. Of, and it's usually, I usually have all the puzzle pieces already there. I just... You ever see how the puzzles have the picture of the puzzle on the box? Mm -hmm. I'm missing the cover. So I don't know what the finished puzzle looks like, but I have Mm -hmm. all the pieces. I just don't know what the cover looks like. So once someone provides that cover, I'm on it. You don't have to tell me nothing else. Oh, perfect call. Thank you. I'm off the phone and I'm working. Aside from what you've done and aside from the support you've gotten from, from mentors or indirect mentors, like how significant has your relationship with your family been in your success? Uh, I come from Caribbean family. If I if I trip and fall today, everybody in my family knows it by tonight. So <laughs> my, I come from a very supportive family. Ninety, I say most of my family didn't know. They knew I had a business. They didn't know how good I was or how mm-hmm. much money I was making, till I got interviewed for a business competition, mm-hmm. and then I mistakenly posted it on Facebook, and they seen. I say mistakenly because then everybody starts asking for money. Um, But I'm very close with my mom and dad, very close with them, close with my brothers. Family is cool. Family will support you. Family will also tell you the wrong stuff. When it's time for me to quit my job, my mom and dad were like, don't quit. See if you go part time. You don't know if this works. And they knew how much money I was making. They see the work. But they have that old mindset of a stable job, benefits, insurance. Now they're like, well, you know what to do. You you do this. Go ahead and be free. But before, while they have the best intentions, family can hold you back. So I come from a very close family. Everybody's up to lift each other up. If I need help, somebody's there to help. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, family will also hold you back. Countless stories of how family has kind of held me back or got in the way. But that's family. What can you do? You don't choose your family, but you love them. We touched on this earlier, but surrounding yourself with people who are positive or who are winning, did you have that early on or did you only start experiencing that once you, you, you had success in your business? I would say I had positive people around, mm-hmm. but even, I wouldn't say I had people who were really winning. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that um, out of my fa- whole family and both of my parents have seven to eight siblings. And on my mom's side, there's about a hundred and something grandchildren who I grew up around. I'd say I'm probably the most successful one. Mm -hmm. I have older cousins who might be a dean or this, this, and this, but they're not really together. Mm -hmm. Um, So growing up, my best friends were not friends outside of school or at school or somewhere. They were cousins because that's who we went to school with. This is who we spent all of our time with. So I wouldn't say I had... (laughs) Um, I definitely had a lot of negative influence, but I wouldn't mm-hmm. say I had winning ones, but I knew there was more for my life that I wanted. Now, my mom took me out of school and made me take a GD at 16, 15, and at 16, I was in college. But even with that, I mean, I'm 16 in college, I'm trying to party and learn how to talk to girls and do everything else. Yeah. But it comes down to, I'd say my number one driving factor has always been me that I wanted more out of life. So even at 16 in school, I knew 
I what I wanted. I just didn't know how to get there. But I knew the end result. End result was always I'm going to own a house by 25. End result was always I was going to travel the world. In my young head, end result, I was going to have all the women in the music videos, this, this, and this. I didn't know how I was going to get there. Mm. So once I started getting off the path, once I started making money, I mean, I was 16. So by 18, I was an aircraft mechanic making $30 an hour. By 21, I was a pilot um, getting recruited to Kuwait by a prince to work on his private jet, mm-hmm. which I was turning down. I was working for, oh, okay, I know the transfer point. So I was 21, working, I got the job, working for this rich guy in Atlanta, Corey Media. He has this big smoke stuff. And we were working on his private jet. And that really showed me like, yo, there's people out here with money. He had three girlfriends, he's 70. He had three girlfriends, 22. He bought each of them a white Audi. Wow. Each of them a white Audi. They all look the same, I can tell them. On his birthday, he had helicopter rides at his mansion. We're working on his jet. Not a day go by that he didn't take us out to dinner. Or some other rich person came in. I was talking about my love of cars with one guy. Just an old guy who hangs around. He's like, oh yeah, I have a 1958 something Audi this. I'm original owner. This Rolex, every day there's a different Rolex on his arm. And I was like, wait a second, this guy has money. So I started hanging around then and I started changing the way I dressed, changing the way I did stuff. And I would say that as the point where I was hanging around successful people where I was like, okay, there's more to this. And even my boss then, who's cool, I need to hit him up. He was like, yo, next time when you go back to work as an aircraft mechanic and these jobs hire you, get your own LLC and have them hire you as a contractor versus a direct employee. Mm. Because you can write everything off, you'll make more money in the long run to do it. So just being around that taught me a lot. I mean, and that's huge because I don't think everyone has an opportunity to have exposure to that, right? Because you, right. like I said earlier, you don't know what you don't know. Um, oftentimes, I think the way we're portrayed, like I've mentioned to you before, is that we see ourselves in the role of like uh, an entertainer, like a rapper, ball player. And, and that's, think how that I saw that's, myself. that's how you saw yourself too? A big pimping video is still my favorite. That's how I saw my life going, but that's not realistic. There's more than that. But, exactly. There's more than that. But we're not taught that because we're shown a, a stereotype of what life, like you said, a ball player, rapper, this or that. But there's ways to get money not just get money, but get real money. Mm-hmm. Most NBA players are broke. Mm-hmm. Because why? Lack of knowledge. They don't know how to keep their money. They don't know how to protect themselves with women. They don't know how to do a lot of stuff. Henceforth, when you go to the NBA, go to the NFL, freshman year, they have whole classes to teach you how to protect yourself, how to invest your money, how to do this. What, what do they do? They go and flex and show it off on Instagram and mess up. So... As a as a people, we're not taught that responsibility. We're not taught that, you know, that there's other ways around stuff, how to make our own way. Back in Nam, Vietnam days, when everybody was getting drafted, we would get drafted and go to the Marines and armies. We'd just show up at the draft station. Mm-hmm. Where I hate to say the white people, but the more privileged, smarter, known people knew you got drafted. Let me go sign up for the Air Force. And now we're not ended up in combat. Mm. let me join the ministry school Now I'm going to school to be a pastor and now I'm not getting drafted. Let me go to Canada. Now I'm not getting drafted, but we're going to showing up at the draft office because we got called there and we're dying in the trenches. David, you so, got to, you've got to say that again, because this uh, the access to information is, I think it just kind of slips between. It's everything. It's everything. And in this day and age where we have so much access, we don't take advantage. Mm. We, our, our information comes from TV. So what you watch Shark Tank, Shark Tank is going to teach you how to run a business. Mm-hmm. It's going to show you who didn't know how to run their business, but it's not going to teach you how to run a business. Mm-hmm. You're going to learn that stuff by studying yourself, by looking and seeking for your own questions and answers. And that takes you back down to your reading and preparing. Speaking of us as African Americans and like, you know, the African diaspora throughout the world, uh, how 
important do you think entrepreneurship or investing is to our community? I have my own feelings on that, man. Um, I believe you should always give back and help. Mm -hmm. During COVID, I was taking $1,000 a week and feeding people out the country in South America and stuff. Mm -hmm. During COVID, we, I personally, not for nothing other than because I felt called to, fed 1,000 families. And I believe in giving back. But at the same time, I believe, and I've traveled the world, right? I have family still in South America who I was out there with my mom in Guyana, South America. And I saw one of my cousins like, hey, where's your kids? And she's like at home. Like they're not in school and she didn't really answer me. So when we seen my mom, my mom asked the same questions. Where's the kids at home? Why aren't they at school? And then it comes out that we didn't have enough money to send the kids to school today. Mm -hmm. I have family who still uses outhouses. I have family and I paid for a surgery. He was riding his bike, hurt his leg, went swimming in a pond in the river and they didn't have money and bacteria ate his leg to the point where they were gonna have to amputate. And it cost me $1,100 to fix it and get skin grafts. So I believe in giving back, but I believe us as Americans, African-American descent have so much opportunity, but we don't utilize it. So as far as giving back, I believe in teaching, but I'm not gonna tell you, anybody who ever tell me, and I did this with you, I said, hey, you wanna talk? Sure, here's my number, here's the time to call. And you call on time. But there's people who believe I need to call them or I need to chase them for their job. If I tell you, hey, we're doing a month of consultations, call me on these days at these times. If you don't call me, I'm not reaching out to see if you're okay. Mm -hmm. That's your job because you have to want it more than I want it. Mm -hmm. And I find we don't want it as much as we should. So where I believe in helping people and giving information and teaching, I don't believe in chasing somebody down. And that's the difference between me and let's say a good teacher in high school. A good teacher in high school is going to go look for their student and make sure they're good. Me, if that's the path you want to go, that's the path you want to go. Yeah. And that's where I have a difference in that opinion. You want to be a crab, be a crab. When you're ready to come to me, I can lead a horse to water. I can't make it drink. So when you're ready to come to me, I'm here for you. But if you're not, don't come to me. So I'm already going to waste wasting my time. But I do feel like there's people out there who, if you pursue them and show them a better way, they will change. But it's just not me. I have to stick with what I'm strong with and my points. And my points are, if you come to me, we're willing to learn with an open mind, I'll teach you the world. But if you don't, I'm not going to chase you to do it. And there's people out there who will chase you and I give them all the <laughs> accommodations in the world because I, you know, people like that, is what makes the world go round. Um, last weekend, I went and found one of my old teachers, the one who I actually got my GD through. I haven't seen him in, I'm 32. I haven't seen him in 12 years. No, 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 no. I got my GD at 15, so 17 years. Shocked and happy as hell to see me. Yeah. And when I start telling him my story where I'm at now, it's just mind blowing. Then I paid for lunch, a simple lunch, $30. Mind blowing, man. Never had one of my students come back and find me and then take me to lunch. No one takes me to lunch. Simple yeah. stuff. And I won't say he chased me, but at the same time, he put the effort in me. I was there to learn. He put the effort in me. Would he have chased me? Yeah, he would have chased me. But I think in this day and age, we have to stop so much looking because we have opportunities. You can make money on a cell phone. You never need to touch a laptop and you can make money on a cell phone. And everybody has one. So in my belief, I believe that so many people need to stop looking for someone to do something for them and take the time to do it for themselves. And if you do that, I'm all there for you. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that's, that's uh, actually, I think that's one of the issues that faces our communities that we oftentimes look to a political leader, uh, a religious figure, or whatever it may be to solve our problems. But at the end of the day, like you're responsible for you. And um my dad called me talking about the election. I was like, I don't even know who's winning. Yeah. Like, Why? I said, no matter who wins, I'm going to make money. Their winning is not going to affect me one bit. No one's doing nothing for me anyways. Neither of them is going to do nothing for me. Why should I have to look for them? My success, my failure, my wins, my loss are in my hands and what I do with them. And like you said, everybody, we tend to look for a handout from political to family to anything. My family don't support my business. 
man. My friends don't support me. My friends and my friends never mentioned my business, whether I had one until they seen their favorite Instagram model with my product. Yeah. At that point, it was Dave. Let me invest in you. I made fifty thousand dollars already. What are you gonna do for me? Yeah. People even to this day look for handouts, and people and we as ourselves tend to take wood from our boat to help someone else build their boat. And neither of us are going to succeed that way. Mm. Yeah. in the process of trying to fill someone else's cup, yours becomes empty in the process. It's empty. So you've got to, at the same yeah. time, be able to maintain that somehow, do in a way that's sustainable. Not only is that a drain on your finances, but it's a drain on your emotional power. Mm. And that your emotional and mental is where the money comes from. When you're in a happy spot, any entrepreneur will tell you, when I'm happy, when things are good, I make more money. When I'm stressed, when I'm injured, I make less money because my mentality is not the same. And when you are constantly giving, you're never refilling your own cup. And so that's, you know, my take on the whole helping others. I believe you should help, but at no point should you empty your cup to help. Yeah. People have to come ready, you know. Otherwise, you're doing nothing but draining. David, I got to say, I respect what you're doing and I respect the, uh, the success that you've had. Um, but th I think what I respect the most about you is that you live by your word. Everything you've been saying, whether that's about being diligent, whether that's about being prepared, or even about wanting to give back, you're, you are a person who gives back. And I, from what I understand, one of the ways you do give back in a way that supports others, but obviously still allows you to enjoy some of your freedoms and your time is you have uh, you teach others to do something similar, right? Correct. Yeah, I have a course. I teach other people. I love teaching. Well, I didn't think I would, but I love teaching. I love helping. I, I jump on a phone call with anybody. And not only will I tell them how to run their business or what products they should make, even if it's a product I'm personally trying to make, I'm like, oh, this product will sell. Mm -hmm. I would give you my own suppliers. I'm not trying to hide nothing from nobody because what's for you, nobody can take. Me and you could have the same spaghetti sauce recipe. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I guarantee both of our sauces are going to taste different. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about what you do in that program. Um, is that a course or is that co coaching? What does that look like? Because I'm sure that- I do coaching mm -hmm. and I do a course. So I have uh, my beauty course and it's essentially teaching you and I'm using my businesses. I'm not using just information I know. I'm showing you step by step with my business. So I tracked everything. Not everybody what does. What I did. Mm -hmm. No, because they don't want nobody to take what they do. No one wants what to give it away. Exactly. And I don't care. I give it all away. What I did, my suppliers, where to get it from, where to go find your recipes. I even throw sample recipes in there. 15 hours. And I'm still adding more videos. And 15 hours of everything you need. And I... I'm not just teaching you how to make your products. I'm teaching you how to market it. I'm teaching you how to design your packaging and where to go for inspiration. And at the end of the day, I'm showing you how to sell it. Mm -hmm. I'm even taking my most money. What's the word I'm looking for? My most profitable emails and putting them in there and be like, yo, just change these words right here. I'm showing you step by step because by you winning, I'm winning. You can't get so far and not give back. And my course is the way I give back. But at the same time, you have to be ready. I, and with my consulting, I do the same. I have an eight-week consulting program. Mm -hmm. And um, I tell them, yo, like, I don't really need your money. I only take your money because if it's free, you're not going to take it serious. Yes, I will. No, you won't. No, you won't. If there's no pain, there's no gain. So don't come to me till you're ready. When you're ready, come to me. I, for, I got money, so forget that. Don't come to me if you're not ready because once you say go, we're running. And you have deadlines to go every week. And one of my main, one of my favorite students, I mean, within eight weeks, he took his idea for a brand and had a full business ready to go, labeled up, bottled up, packaged, everything while living in Puerto Rico, just from eight weeks of consulting. Then he flew out to Brazil with me and I helped him do a photo shoot. I paid for his photo shoot and everything. Like, yeah, I love what you did. Like, yeah, all props to you. Come out here. I got a house. I got an extra room for you. Come. And they actually did. I didn't think they would. And mm -hmm. we filmed videos and did all the content with my photographer. 
So I'm all about helping and I want to see people succeed. I want to see people win. And my course and my consulting is the way I help people and really help give back with that. And that's a, I think that's a really clever way to do it. And um, so where can our listeners find out more about you or take you up on that offer? Uh, my Instagram is opulent underscore LIF3. Mm-hmm. Um, I answer all DMs. And my course is mybeautycourse.com. And from there, you get access to my consulting, any upsells, such as I'm dropping a, um ebook on my marketing tactics and stuff like that. And that's where all that's going to be at but everything's in a link on my bio and again that's on my instagram opulent underscore live three and if you want to see my business my website's puretropics.com same as our instagram handle yeah and uh for our listeners i mean obviously you can tell from hearing david's story uh from his upbringing to his journey some of the lessons he shared he's obviously an authentic guy and uh, from my own personal experience, I can say that not everybody's willing to share uh, from A to Z what they've done. Uh, he's someone that's doing it. So definitely take him up on that offer. Um, but David, I mean, you've been a wealth of information and I'm, I'm grateful that you've come on here and that you're paying it forward and you're sharing your, your knowledge and information. And I just wish nothing but the best for you, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, man. You're one of the better interviewers I've had. So <laughs> you actually have, you have stuff set up, set up right and you ask the right question.